Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor. I was part of this conference a few years ago, so it's a, always a great honor to be invited back. Uh, I am a neonatologist. I'm actually one of the founders of the field of neonatology. I started a special care nursery in Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital in 1963. At that time, there really uh, were no treatments for sick babies. And so uh, the treatments had to be invented and, and uh, two things that were invented that are of great uh, significance and used throughout medicine. One is the ventilator. The uh, vent ventilator uh, was invented for tiny little premature babies, two pound babies. Uh, and the ventilator had to be very precise and very uh, sensitive. So the ventilator that's used on everybody is, uh, was invented for the infants in the work that we did uh, in neonatology. The other thing you should realize is that little babies have only a small amount of blood. So micro technique had to be invented for the little babies. And that micro technique is used to do blood testing on uh, all of us. Now, as a neonatologist, how did I get into this field of brain death and related issues? Well, in 1975, I had a baby in our nursery, Joseph. And uh, Joseph was born prematurely and was on a ventilator. And when he was on the ventilator for uh, several uh, uh, weeks, Joseph wouldn't move, Joseph wouldn't breathe. And so a brainwave test was done. His brainwaves were flat, it was interpreted, and what's written on his chart is consistent with cerebral death. The test was repeated, unchanged the second time, and so it was suggested to stop treating him. I said, no, I don't do that. I treat babies. Some live, some die, but I just continue to treat them. I continued to treat Joseph. Joseph got off the ventilator and to make the story as brief as possible, when he went to school, he got uh, good grades. He uh, uh, ran track, played baseball, and he's uh, eventually married and has three children. So that started my study of, uh, of uh, brain death and related issues. The next slide. So J Joseph was very significant. There's, uh, there are many patients that I have participated in their treatment and care, and, and uh, they all don't get such notoriety as Jahai McMath. Uh, Jahai McMath, that uh, uh, some of you might remember, was a 13-year-old girl who uh, went into the hospital for uh, uh, tonsil surgery. And at, uh, during the post-operative period, she had a cardiorespiratory arrest. Uh, her, uh, uh, a death certificate was issued on, uh, on Jahai on December the 12th, 2013. Her mother, it was about Christmas time, her mother got on the TV and pleaded for someone to help. So I got on the plane and I went to California uh, to uh, see Jahai. Uh, uh, Jahai was on a ventilator and They uh, at the hospital. They wouldn't even call her by name. They referred to her as a dead body. Uh, uh, Jahai got no nutrition for uh, almost a month. Uh, uh, she had the death certificate in California. We looked for a place for her to go. And some of my friends found a place in New Jersey. So uh, uh, Jahai actually was taken out of the hospital in uh, uh, California during the night because, um, uh, and then flown on an airplane to, uh, uh, to New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey has a conscience clause and the conscience clause says if the uh, relatives do not believe in brain death, then uh, the person is allowed to continue to uh, uh, live and cannot be declared dead until uh, there is no heartbeat or circulation or respiration. 
So Jahai went to uh, uh, New Jersey and there they did a, a tracheostomy in a peg tube. Uh, keep in mind that almost always when a patient is on a ventilator for about two weeks, they need a tracheostomy to get out of the ICU. So I'll, I'll give you a few things to remember and carry with you. And one of them that you should remember and carry with you is that if a patient is on a ventilator for about two weeks, they need a tracheostomy. They, sometimes it can go a little bit longer, but about two weeks. And then a PEG tube. Uh, uh, PEG are all capital letters, P-E-G. Uh, uh, it has nothing to do with a PEG, but what it, those letters stand for, uh, P is per, uh, the, the, uh, the Latin word per, pair, which means through, and then the E is uh, esophagus, esophageal, and then the G is the gastrostomy, the word gaster means stomach. So it's a, a feeding tube that is put through, uh, uh, the light is passed down through the esophagus and then uh, uh, a small incision is made in the stomach uh, area so that a feeding tube can go directly into, uh, um, into the stomach through the abdominal wall. It makes it so much easier to take care of the patient uh, who continues to need feeding. Uh, um, when I started in neonatology, we didn't have any of those kinds of things like plastic tubes like we have now. So it's it's easy to put in a peg tube. So once uh, Jahai got to New Jersey, they did the tracheostomy and they did the peg tube. And then they too were unhappy that they had to continue to treat Jahai so Jahai was in the hospital for nine months getting really uh, um, uh, treatment, and I don't mean to be uh, ne negative uh, uh, about that because I'm so grateful that the hospital took Jahai uh, because we really had no one else in the United States that would take her. Along those lines, I, we have two other patients uh, in subsequent years that to get treatment uh, we had to transfer them to Guatemala because we could not get treatment any place in the United States. But in any event, Jahai was in the hospital for about nine months and then was able to go home. And really uh, at home is when the first good treatment started for her nine months after her uh, uh, declaration of, uh, of, de of uh, death in California. So we could continue to treat her at home Jahai got to where when her mother would say, give me a thumbs up, uh, her uh, uh, thumb would come up. Uh, uh, she'd be there in bed and her mother would say, raise your left leg and Jahai's left leg would come up. Uh, and, and, uh, and so uh, Jahai continued to, uh, um, uh, to thrive. She, she went through puberty uh, and had um, um, menstruation. Uh, and, uh, and Jahai was uh, uh, alive in New Jersey uh, after being declared uh, uh, brain dead uh, in California um, uh, much earlier. So uh, dead in California uh, in 2013, death certificate uh, it issued in New Jersey, uh, alive, treated. Uh, Jahai lived uh, another four years and then uh, died not related to her uh, uh, brain issues. So the next slide. So um, uh, 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 there are many other patients that I could uh, uh, tell you about, but, but uh, um, uh, the, the issues are all pretty much the same across the board. And to understand what the issues have to do with the, uh, uh, with life and what, what it is that we're uh, uh, protecting, the, the, the life uh, is the life of a person and the uh, uh, person is living and the person, uh, there's a unity of the spiritual and the physical uh, uh, person. There, there's a unity, a oneness, spiritual and physical. The person is alive from true conception until true death. Now, why do we have to put in true conception? Well, because they have distorted the word uh, uh, for something else, and then they want to use words like fertilization 
you have to use the word conception because that the conception is the word con means bringing together the sept is like idea uh, that kind of thing it's spiritual so you have to use conception to bring in the spiritual and it has to be true conception you should be able to just say conception but they've distorted the uh such that you have to say true and then until true death you should be able to just say death but because of inventions of words like brain death you have to say true death now every organ of the organism is alive uh, uh the basic unit of biology is cell uh, groups of cells make up tissues groups of cells and tissues make up organs uh, groups of organs make up systems to carry out function. There's an interdependence of organs and systems that maintains the unity of, of the body. Uh, the the uh, complicated uh, organism like a human being is, we use the term organism, it's a biological term, and, and there's an interdepend interdependence of organs and systems to preserve the unity uh, of the of that person, it's a soul body unity, and it's there during the entire time uh, on Earth. And no one organ controls all the other organs. The next slide. The next slide. Uh, um, preservation follows creation. Once the uh, uh, once creation occurs, uh, and and early on. Uh, blood is formed and circulation and uh, is there to uh, for to maintain the unity of, of, uh, uh, of the life of the person. There has to be blood and circulation. The heart is a very important organ. It has its own nervous and its own endocrine systems. And, and uh, uh, breathing is important. Uh, to live on Earth, we have to get in. Oxygen has to go in and carbon dioxide goes out. To live on Earth, we need water. To live on Earth, we need food. We need the proper temperature of the body and the environment, and there have to be exits for urine and for stool. Uh, 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 one of the things you should um, keep in mind is that without breathing, without oxygen, without getting rid of carbon dioxide, uh, the, the, uh, a death will occur within ordinarily within minutes. Uh, uh, without water, death uh, uh, occurs in in uh, um, one to two weeks. Without food, death occurs uh, one to two months. So remember that minutes, uh, weeks, and months. So far as uh, doing it without those. The next slide. Now, dead is different. It's a death is the absence of life. Uh, the Greek has words bios, like uh, biology, uh, meaning life, uh, pathos, like uh, pathology, uh, meaning disease. Uh, once the, someone goes from being alive to being dead, what's left on earth is the remains. Uh, it's not functioning, but it's more than uh, not functioning. There is destruction uh, uh, that, that goes on, disintegration, dissolution. Uh, corruption, putrefaction, decay, rigor mortis. Uh, some of these things uh, begin uh, 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 as soon as the uh, uh, as soon as the death occurs at the microscopic level, and again, eventually gets enough that you can see it with your eyes. You you uh, uh, you you have other ways of identifying that the destruction is there. After true death, and the Latin word is morse vera uh the uh to uh use those that term correctly to refer to the latin morse vera true death that that was in comparison to the latin words morse appearance like apparent so things that that looked like death but weren't death and so to distinguish that the in the um uh in the thought process uh, uh, true death, more sphera, death is, is what there, what remains on earth is a dead body, a corpse, a cadaver, the, the, uh, the Latin word 
is spelled the same, but is pronounced uh, differently. Uh, and the corpse is empty. Uh, it, it's without life. It's without the dynamic life principle, the soul. Uh, the next slide. Now, brain death is not based on any kind of science. Brain, brain death was invented. It was uh, invented in the late 60s. The first article on death that's in the literature in the on brain death in the literature in the United States is in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1968. And the title of the article is a definition of irreversible coma. Keep in mind that coma is like a pause. When uh, when you're dead, you're not in coma. Coma is different. And and so they did a thing like applied the word irreversible. Uh, uh, anytime something is uh, uh, said to be irreversible, but then it's reversed, it's no longer irreversible. You can only know uh, uh, something that's irreversible from the opposite, and the opposite is to make it reversible. So they, they did that. Keep in mind that a doctor can observe absence of the functioning. A doctor can uh, observe uh, disintegration. Uh, destruction, but a doctor cannot observe irreversibility. He can imply it from other findings that, uh, and put them together, but it isn't something that's uh, uh, an empirical observation. So the Harvard criteria is what was published in 1968 in that first article uh, uh, on brain death, and they did not do any uh, animal studies. We animal rights people are concerned about studies on, on animals. They, they didn't do any studies on dogs or cats or rats. Uh, and they didn't really look at any patient data either. They just invented brain death and called it, uh, uh, said they had to have it because if they didn't, there's controversy in obtaining organs. And if they didn't have it, there wouldn't be a way to turn off the ventilator and the intensive care units would get crowded. Uh, they, they published the article without animal data, without patient data. The next article was the Minnesota criteria. And with that, the EEG was stricken from the requirement for uh, a brain death. And the British criteria is, is the same, but they did both without patient studies. The NIH criteria is the largest study in the literature. It's a study of, uh, it came out of a study known as the collaborative study that was uh, about 500 patients. But the first thing was of those 500, 44 of them didn't die. And, uh, and of the 10% that they did autopsies on, only about 50% of them had a truly destroyed brain. And there hasn't, they, the criteria were recommended for a larger clinical trial. That was in 1977. And you can see that many years have gone by. It's never been repeated. It's never been uh, studied any further. Uh, but why should they? They already get what they want. And what is it what they want? They want organs for transplantation. The next slide. Uh, this is a um, uh, a drawing of the of the brain, and and uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow. I doubt it. But at the at the largest part of the brain is the uh, is the cerebral cortex, and and uh, the uh, you can see it's the largest part. When EEG is done records electrical activity only from the outer one centimeter or so of the cerebral cortex. And down at the bottom, you see something labeled the brainstem. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the criteria that are used uh, for the declaration of, of, uh, uh, of brain death, they basically revolve around three. One is the uh, uh, unconscious, not necessarily lack of brain waves, but just the patient can't show that they're conscious. And then the brainstem and there are all of the reflexes of the brain are brainstem reflexes. 
and they have to do the ones they look at are the ones that have to do with the eye and the ear that is for the eye shine a light in the eye and the pupil does not respond uh, 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 there's no blink when you come near the eye ice water in the ear and, and they use this regularly can you just imagine ice water in the ear why would you have to do that but that's part of the decoration of, of brain death and then the third one ha has to do with whether the patient could take a breath or not the next slide now to determine if the patient can take a breath they do what's called an apnea test. And I would ask you to remember that, that it's a procedure of an apnea test. Uh, uh, what, what is given to the relatives before they do this test? No, for nothing to speak of or little. Uh, um, they don't get consent. Uh, often you hear about getting consent and we'll say more of it but they don't get any kind of consent. In fact, as they've gone so far uh, that in Nevada, they have passed a law that says, do not ask for consent to do this test. The test itself can cause death or further damage to an already compromised brain. The apnea test is not a predictor, but it's a lethal procedure. What they do in the procedure of the apnea test, the patient is on the ventilator, and they take away the ventilator. They take away the ventilator, uh, not for 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes, but they take away the ventilator for 10 minutes. For 10 minutes, the patient is without getting rid of carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide increases, the patient becomes acidotic. Increasing carbon dioxide and acidosis causes the brain to swell. And, and uh, uh, and so one of the things I'm going to ask you, another thing I'll ask you to remember is that you have to know that if your patient, your, if your relative is in the hospital and on a ventilator, uh, uh, you must instruct no, no, no to the apnea test. Do not let them do the apnea test. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, done in such a way that it cannot help the patient and uh, and can only make the patient get worse. And I mentioned to you Nevada because of a patient by the name of Aiden Nalu uh, in, in Nevada that that again we went there to help Aiden. And and in the course of that, her uh, her uh, um, evaluation was referred to the Supreme Court in Nevada. And we got a seven to zero unanimous decision from the Supreme Court in Nevada to send the uh, case back to the lower court for uh, and to the hospital for more information. And um, um, and and of course uh, she went about a year with with uh, uh, with uh, um, I take it back to she went about six months with little or no treatment and. And then she died before uh, um, be, before it could go back to court. So what did the legislators do is they changed the laws in Nevada. They changed the law so that you don't, do not have to ask for permission to do the apnea test. Furthermore, they changed the law that says that, that if, you, if the doctors say that your relative is uh, uh, brain dead and you don't agree, uh, and you want treatment to continue at least for to further evaluation, then the law says that you may be responsible for all uh, uh, financial things that happen in terms of cost of hospitals, doctors, uh, et cetera. That's written into the law. Be, uh, be assured that they're uh, going to be trying to get those uh, 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 th those uh, laws in other states also. The next slide. Now, now th th this is a uh, recording of a beginning of a heart transplant. You can see as they open the chest, uh, you, you, uh, uh, they open the chest, divide the chest, and then as they divide the chest, you can see 
Uh, there's uh, separating the pericardium, uh, the covering around the heart, and then you see the beating heart, see at the top there, the beating heart. So every time they do a heart transplant, they, they, uh, they stop the beating heart when they get in there. They cut out, essentially cut out a beating heart and transplant it to so someone else. And actually the procedure that you're seeing that eventually they took out the heart, they take out the, the other organs. Uh, um, before that, during it, uh, you know, the kidneys, the liver, the pancreas, the intestines, uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, and the heart and the lungs. and so uh, uh, it, it's uh, uh, an empty carcass by the time they uh, get the uh, organs out. The next slide. Now, uh, uh, organs are taken from those who are called brain dead. Then there's another thing called heart dead. Brain death is a, abbreviated HBD, which means heart beating donor. And then cardiac death is a non-heart beating donor. And so uh, uh, who and what is this non-heart beating donor? That's somebody who has a functioning brain, but they want their organs. So what do they do? They get a do not resuscitate. I think a do not resuscitate is a very bad or order in general because it's far too broad. Uh, if there's something specific that that you don't want to happen uh, uh, to your relatives. Uh, um, um, uh, once you have that condition, you might say, do not put an endotracheal tube in. But if you say, do not resuscitate, uh, that's far too broad, but they get that kind of order. And then what do they do? They take away the life support and, uh, and the heart continues to beat uh, uh, and, and they, they take them off for a period of time, then put them back on, and then they uh, take them off again after they move the patient to the operating room, and and then they um, uh, they wait till the patient is without a pulse. Keep in mind, I didn't say without a heartbeat. It's without a pulse, without a heartbeat strong enough to cause a pulse. How long do they wait? sometimes five minutes, sometimes two minutes. One article in the New England Journal of Medicine and two babies in Colorado, they waited 75 seconds, uh, one minute, 15 seconds without a heart, uh, without a pulse. And that was a signal to take their organs. I want to mention drug overdose. People who uh, uh, have trouble with drugs have serious problems. It's a great concern to uh, the, to them often and to their families and and but they're getting many organs now from overdose of drugs. Next slide. Oxygen is needed uh, 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 until uh, organs are excised, and I want to separate uh, uh, organs and tissues so that you. Uh, un understand the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, the pancreas, and the intestine all come from someone who is living but is declared brain dead, heart beating donor. Uh, uh, and, and then there's some that they can get from cardiac death, non heart beating donor, but they're never truly dead. Tissues, there's the need for oxygen is not so great. So after no circulation, they can take the skin. By the way, skin is not transplanted. It's skinned off and then it becomes like gauze for treatment of uh, burns, but it's not transplanted, uh, uh, at least in general. It's not uh, the bones, corneas, veins, heart valves, connective tissues, and, and they can get those after the circulation has stopped. The next slide. The laws regarding organ transplantation, the, the, the first law was the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act that was passed in 1968. Uh, it, it was at about the same time as the time that brain death was invented, uh, invented. but the brain death law uh, uh, um, did not come into play 
uh, and the Uniform Determination of Death Act did not come into play until 1980. There were other laws uh, before 1980, the American Bar Association Definition of Death and the Uniform Brain Death Act, uh, uh, but the Uniform Definition of Death, UDDA, was uh, um, published in 1980. Uh, and and um, uh, now there's a desire of uniform of changing the Uniform Determination of Death Act uh, uh, to what it is in the accord with the Nevada statute. So you need to be alert to that. You uh, uh, need to realize how how uh, serious things are already. Pa patients or uh, organs are taken while they are uh, uh, alive under the uh, guise of what they call uh, brain death. Uh, brain death means that that somebody is unconscious. They don't have uh, um, some brainstem reflexes. They weren't able to show that they could take a, a breath, but they all have a beating heart and circulation. And then the uh, uh, the HIPAA law. You've all heard of the HIPAA law. Uh, you know that when you go to the doctor. You have to sign a form that says, sign a paper that says they can use the information. Uh, and so you think it has to do with information. You go to the pharmacy, you have to sign a HIPAA law. You go to a lawyer, you have to sign a, a HIPAA docu a document. And so what, it, what is the HIPAA law? You think it's to protect your records, but go read it. There are 14 ways that the government can use your information without your permission. And one of them is to do things to get your organs. Now, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act was revised in 2006, and it's uh, present already uh, in uh, um, 48 states, two states uh, still, um, uh, the two states have it in a way that they have tried to uh, uh, change it, but weren't able to. So it's essentially in all of the states. And what the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act basically said that it presumes that you want to be an organ donor. Uh, uh, and it says, yes, you do have to get permission from someone, it, um, uh, but but they, it was there set up to get organs. Now, uh, you hear a lot of talk these days about the Affordable Care Act, but most of us uh, are not aware of the fact that the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, as you can see, there is preceded by PPACA. It's the, protect the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. They dropped the patient protection, and they should, because there's nothing in there to protect the patient, and that was passed in 2017, and then the Nevada statute in 2017. Uh, uh, the next slide. Organs, the main source of organs are brain dead organs. Organs must be healthy without damage. The consent must come from the donor or a relative responsible party. And then there's opt in and out, opt out. And you, you will hear that the opt in uh, uh, is such that it's presumed that you intend to be an organ donor, and and uh, 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 and the uh, uh, opt out uh, is that you pre uh, it's presumed that you have consented to be an organ donor. Uh, opt out is most re recently is in uh, in in Great Britain, but it's in many of the European countries. Uh, it's been introduced in two states in the United States, but did not get uh, uh, passed. So, so the uh, opt-in says that you have to agree to be an organ donor, but what you don't know is why you have to uh, eventually have someone to agree to taking your organs. Before that, there are many things that can be done to uh, see if you're suitable to be a, don a donor. There are many things done to keep uh, your uh, uh, keep you in good condition for someone else. Keep your organs in good condition for someone else. The next slide. Now, consent is important. 
uh, in, in all of this. Consent refers to uh, giving a permission, an approval, or an agreement. Uh, to be valid, a consent must be one given freely without coercion or, decep or deception. Uh, number two, the consent necessarily presupposes a person with sufficient mental capacity to give it. The next slide. Relatives of brain death, the relatives see the patient uh, in the intensive care unit on an IV, a, a ventilator. Uh, 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 the patient is warm and pink with a beating heart, yet told with no uncertainty that their loved one is already dead. Doesn't sound correct to them, which further compounds their grief and their distress. To make, uh, 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 to make some points clear about the ventilator, the ventilator is mislabeled a respirator many times. Ventilator is the more correct term and it, it's a ventilator. The ventilator is a machine that we use the only thing that the machine does is pushes air in and does that intermittently, but it doesn't push the air out. It's the living person that has to push the air out. So the ventilator only pushes the air in and it only works when someone is alive and it's completely dependent on ha having lungs to, for the oxygen to get in and the carbon dioxide to get out, having a beating heart and circulation to carry the blood and the oxygen uh, to the patient uh, and then to pick up the carbon dioxide and carry it back to the lungs. The way the ventilator works, it pushes air in and then uh, our, our chest and muscles of our, uh, of our chest, the diaphragm, they have elastic properties. You, you can understand the elastic properties if you think of a rubber band laying on the desk. The rubber band is there, it's limp, and you know if you stretch it, that it will then bounce back. It takes energy to bounce back. Where does that energy come from? The energy comes from the person who pulls, uh, who stretches the rubber band. The rubber band has elastic properties so it can store the energy. That's the way we breathe. Uh, the muscles pull, uh, uh, contract, that makes the chest air goes in and then the muscles of the chest wall and the diaphragm, God gives them the elastic properties so that it can then push the air out. So the ventilator uh, uh, only moves the air in, everything else is done in the living person. And uh, uh, there is no way to uh, uh, for a ventilator to be effective in a corpse because to be effective, not only does the air have to go in, but a heart and circulation and lungs and, and, uh, uh, and organs and tissues, all of that is necessary for the ventilator to function. The next slide. The relatives of the brain dead, uh, they're told there's a way of finding meaning in death by making the best of, a trans, uh, of the trans tragic situation. Uh, they're, they're told uh, to, quote, find consolation in the fact that some concrete good has come of their loss. That is, the uh, organs uh, uh, can be helpful to uh, someone else. The next slide. They opt in, the organ, to repeat the opt in, the organs are not taken unless and until there's a signature. The signature can come uh, um, from the person himself or herself. The signature can, there's a decrease, descending class of persons that, that uh, can give permission, mother, father, son, daughter, brother, sister, that kind of thing. And it gets all, all the way down to grandchildren. And then another one is any person who shows interest in the last month. Uh, um, and, and so it really can be anybody. If they can't find any of those, then the hospital administrator or the coroner is the one that gives permission in the opt-in. In the opt-out, it's presumed consent with the default to proceed unless the object objection is registered. They have tried to pass this in two states uh, in the United States, but without success, they have it in multiple countries throughout the world, especially in Europe. 
Uh, and so if you go to Europe and you get unconscious, uh, um, you can just be, uh, be know that it's presumed consent that, that you have given that you organs can be taken unless you document that you do not want to be an organ donor. Uh, uh, the next slide. Now, uh, opt out, presume consent, but I would ask, is it consent? Is it a fiction? And it certainly is. Are the brain dead donors truly dead? The next slide. Now, the personalistic norm, uh, it's the interest of individuals that prevails over society, science and society. Um, uh, this kind of thought process, especially with all the things we've been going through uh, uh, re related to COVID and the like, and we hear these things about science and, and, uh, and then uh, um, uh, science is uh, a matter of making observations and, and, uh, and then coming to some postulation and then further observation. Uh, um, and that kind of thing. Science is orderly. And of course, science can have its effect on society and society can be there. But what Max Simon, a French physician, uh, wrote in 1845, quotes, one cannot stress this principle enough. The most indigent patient, even as the most useless to society, cannot be subjected to experiments that could endanger his life, perish science rather than such principle, close quotes. Uh, uh, keep this in mind as uh, th these things are going on and being developed in our society and other things are going on. The next slide. Now, what needs to happen? The first thing uh, uh, that I have listed is there is full and complete information must given be given about what's happening. Uh, uh, and, and I encourage people to read and to study and to learn. And yes, I know it takes a little bit of time. Uh, 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 and so, but you need full and complete information before you can uh, make a decision about uh, uh, or. Um, taking organs. When you go to get your uh, driver's license and uh, uh, they ask you, do you, do you wish to be an organ donor? And you answer uh, yes or no to that. Uh, just so you know, they, they, uh, uh, the students of driver's education, they get educated as to, uh, as to saying yes to that question, you wish to be an organ donor. Uh, and incidentally, then they ask you uh, uh, another question. Uh, do, you, do, you wit, uh, do you have a living will? Uh, 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 that goes right along with it. And, and, uh, uh, and I think to myself, these are serious matters. Why do we have this going on at license bureaus? It would seem to me the license bureau ought to uh, be determining if you can drive safely or not, not in terms of whether you have a living will, which is a, a, a legal thing. And incidentally, no one should have a living will. Uh, is, is there a document that that you uh, uh, could have to uh, instruct your relatives? And yes, that's a power of attorney. And incidentally, you need to know that everyone who reaches the age of uh, majority in Ohio, it's the age of 18, must have a living will because if they get unconscious, uh, uh, the court system will appoint someone else, not their parents, to be their guardian. I deal with this uh, um, uh, young man lives in Texas, goes to California to go to school, uh, gets involved in an accident, it's unconscious. Uh, uh, the, the, by the time the mother gets to California, uh, um, al already a court-appointed attorney has been involved, and and uh, and that's done to get organs. Uh, uh, keep in mind that every organ that's taken is taken from a living person. They're not dead when the taking of organs begins. 
uh, uh, brain death, brain death is not post-mortem organ donation. Post-mortem, I put it there in italics, indicating a Latin word, meaning after death, explicitly gives a, a method, a mechanism to refuse uh, uh, it, uh, what needs to happen, you have to have an explicit uh, documentation. Uh, there has to be this, that the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act in all 50 states says that, that you can have a document of refusal, but they don't, they don't give you any way of getting that document of uh, refusal. Uh, we do at Life Guardian Foundation, and you can check on our website, www.lifeguardianfoundation.org. And, and you, you, we have cards, uh, we send them out uh, uh, and uh, show you what's on those cards. But you have to have opt out or you're going to be an organ donor. And then the focus ought to be on God-given life. And again, there has to be a mechanism of refusal. The next slide. What, what's on the medical opt-out card? It's there to protect and preserve your life. And what it says, I direct all medical treatments and care, including nutrition and hydration, however administered, be given to protect and preserve my life. Do not hasten death. Do not do an apnea test. And I told you about that. Remember, no, no, no to the apnea test. Do not take any organ for transplantation or any other purpose. We, uh, uh, we have these cards. Uh, we do send them out. We also have a, a, a booklet that has uh, many of the things that I've talked about today and many more. And if you get in touch with us, we'll be happy to uh, uh, send them out to you. But in there, we do have a, a form, a suggested form for power of attorney. And as I go through more and more uh, in my life, I find out that, that our power of attorney basically says what's on this card, but it designates someone to be the power of attorney, the first and the second agent for that and says that you want to be treated. Uh, uh, and, and I think you should not have uh, anything else. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not giving legal advice. You should check with your own uh, lawyer. Uh, I, uh, I'm a, a doctor who has studied these issues and, and the best protection that I can see that you can get if there is any way you can get any protection, but if there is a way, it has to say you want to be treated. Uh, and don't worry about getting too much treatment. You will not get too much treatment. I can almost guarantee you, you will not get too much treatment. There are too many forces to, uh, that are going on to end your life. Uh, the next slide. Yes, and the next one. And and uh, the next one, we'll get there in, in a minute. I, uh, yes, uh, uh, I want to make a point that, that, that the, uh, the, one of the major roots of the culture of death that we're in is the uh, invention of brain death. It's a mendacity. A mendacity is a deception. It's a lie. And and uh, and it, it's done to uh, um, accomplish something else. And mendacity is the best word and uh, to uh, to describe brain death. And we have in our society going on what's going on is palliative care. Palliative care is rooted in brain death because in brain death you can can see that somebody uh, has a beating heart and circulation and respiration uh, and, and someone calls them dead. Well, it's a great big lie. And so if you can uh, get that lie across and it uh, started in uh, the late 60s, 1968 is when the first article was in the literature, but then it got many people, many doctors, many, many people to accept that you're dead with a beating heart and circulation. If you can ha have that, then it's easy to say, well, uh, if, if, if you um, 
uh, uh, cannot carry out the ordinary uh, uh, living things like, like they ask uh, ask you when you get a little older. Do you need any help in getting dressed? Uh, um, uh, can you feed yourself? Uh, and then, of course, weight loss, multiple hospitalizations, uh, uh, difficulty with controlling physical and emotional symptoms uh, related to serious medical illness. Um, uh, 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 th these are triggers to refer for palliative care, and you can look them up, www.getpalliativecare.org, the next slide. And, and uh, uh, again, um, family requests for feudal care. Feudal care is a, a big, serious problem. It, it's uh, been there. Most of the people don't realize that that once the, the hospital administrator gets involved with determining that the uh, treatment is futile, then the, uh, it's taken out of the doctor's hands and the administrator uh, uh, then is the one that has the final say so, at least in the, in the futile care policies that, that I've seen. Uh, 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 tube feedings in the cognitively impaired and seriously ill patients tube fittings that you know when i started doing this it was rubber tubes that were put in but now we have nice plastics taken the peg tube i have patients that are at home they go into the emergency room and get the peg tube in and go back home the same day uh, uh that, that these things uh, are uh, avoided then the next slide uh, is a blank one and then the next slide I want to uh, call your attention to Romans 1.25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshiped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So in, in these matters of life and death, uh, uh, life is a gift and we can protect and preserve our life and protect and preserve the life of other, uh, uh, other persons. Uh, we ought not uh, kill ourselves or kill other persons. And that protection of life ha has to go from the very beginning all the way until uh, true death. And we live in a time when, when, when you get seriously ill, uh, you ought to, they, they say you either should be an organ donor, which will get that, end your life, or you should uh, have your life support removed, that kind of thing. And of course, I would say no to organ transplantation. And I would, would say no to shortening life and hastening death. The, uh, uh, remember, pray a lot and pray a lot. And we need to pray a lot, especially uh, uh, now at a time when our country as I see it, is in great jeopardy. Uh, uh, and, and it's important to pray for uh, the leaders of our country, uh, to pray for ourselves and our families. And, uh, um, and, and as we take a stand for life to protect and preserve life from true conception till true death. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this conference.